All right, if you're new to my channel, I usually do craft videos, but lately I've been trying to read through a couple of these old local books that were made in the early 90s about murder, mystery, mayhem, and the many, many naughty things that happen in the Yarmouth area. So today we're going over The Ghost of Sam, Yarmouth 1983 or 1981, and probably finishing up this book with the last two stories. And yeah, that is going to be the end of this book. I did get my hands on the first version of the book, or the first release, or the first series, whatever. Might do that, but these are more afternoon reads on a rainy night. So I'm not very good at reading aloud, but some is better than none, I guess. The Ghost of Sam, Yarmouth, 1981. In the early 1800s, there stood a house in the center of Yarmouth. For unknown reasons, the ownership of the home continued to change until real estate company took possession in 1977. In 1981, Clara, per Clara Purston and her family <coughs> were looking for a new place to live. <coughs> This is why I don't charge. And her family were looking for a new place to live when they came upon the aforementioned house. Care hated the house from the beginning, but could not, but again, but could not her feelings. Kara hated the house from the beginning, but could not her feelings. This is why grammar is important. Anyway. However, her husband and family were quite happy with the house, and the Prestons rented it. When Claire, when Claire, when Kara inquired as to why the furniture was still remaining in the house, she was told by her landlord that the previous tenants had suddenly moved out overnight, leaving behind their belongings. She accepted this explanation, and the family moved in in June 1981. The house had three doors in the front and three doors in the back. After the Pre Prestons, Prestons moved in, they discovered that between the second and the third door at the back of the house was a Ouija board. At the time, they thought nothing of it. That summer, mysterious occurrences started taking place. One night, when Kara's husband and her best friend, Linda, friend Linda's husband, had gone out, the two women decided to take out the Ouija board and for, for something to do. The board started asking questions, and Kara would answer, thinking it was her girlfriend and was initiating the qu who was initiating the questions. The spirit of the for the spirit of the board referred to Kara as honey, and told her that he he Sam was part of her life, and she had been part of his life in the past. Then a question came up, and Kara asked if he could stay for a while. Kara. Thinking this was her friend questioning, friend's question answered, yeah, as long as you like, the more the merrier. Of course, this was an open invitation for the spirit. That night was the beginning of a very strange happenings in the Pres Pearson home. While Linda and her husband were relaxing on the sofa, watching TV in the living room, the closet door opened a total open and 13 ghosts appeared. They moved through the living room and throughout the kitchen where three doors opened and closed. Linda and her husband were so disturbed and upset they went home and tried to block out the experience. Kara had an overwhelming desire to look further into the situation, <laughs> spent more of her time absorbed with the Ouija board. Her husband found it on the kitchen table one night and threw it in the garbage. The next morning it appeared back on the kitchen table. The family had nothing to do with this action. <clears throat> As Kara's husband went to work and the children to school, Kara would bring the board to an upstairs room and play with it. She began. She became very obsessed with making contact with the spirits. Kara, beca Kara became dependent on it. And when items of jewelry started missing, she would consult the Ouija board and the board to would tell her where to find it. <clears throat> Once there was a ring missing in the house, and Kara went to the board and asked where it was. The board, the bowl, the board, told her it was in the bottom of the flower jar. So Kara went and looked, and sure enough, the ring was there. 
Even while Kara was watching television with her family, the ghost would be talking to her and she would talk right back to them. There was all, <clears throat> they were always with her. Kara was convinced she had connections with Sam, maybe as a wife or sister, or maybe she had killed him in her past life. Then the situation turned serious. A face appeared on her son's wall telling him to kill his parents. This was when the fear set in. Then a silhouette resembling Sam appeared in her daughter Amber's windows and remained there to this present day. On the night Kara and Amber were shopping at Kmart, ooh, that's been gone a while, they noticed an old looking man in, the 40, in his 40s or so who had a large nose slanted to one side of his short face and wore an old fashioned blue pinstripe suit. His eyes were all black except for the whites around the pupils and his hair was at all slicked back. He started following them around. At that point in time, Care remembered that Sam had told her that he was going to show himself in public. He had As he continued following them, she grew afraid and grabbed her daughter and ran. During Care's next contact with Sam, he asked her why she ran from him, and she told him she was scared. Sam also informed Kara, <coughs> Kara that he had entered into her hu husband's body and had made love to her. The next morning, when she woke, she found a knife under her pillow. She was being forced to kill her husband, but something stopped her. She didn't know what. She could have easily killed him, but she would not have known the reason for her actions. At that point, the family was, completely, was in complete turmoil. Kara reached out for help. The first pastor she contacted went upstairs to Amber's room where the spirits were. Amber's room could not be heated, even though the heating system in the house was perfectly working order. It was in perfectly working order. The pastor's face turned white and his eyes grew large. He turned and walked out of the house, never to come back again. Kara didn't give up. She tried another parish minister. He came to the home, but nothing but did nothing. She finally found a minister who had the knowledge and courage to pursue the presence of the spirits. The minister, followed by Kara and her husband, proceeded through each room of the house. He carried a cross, and in each room he said a prayer. After each prayer, they would hear a bang, which signified the spirits leaving their, the dimension, the, their dimension. When... <clears throat> They reached the main room Care had used the Ouija board in. The minister encouraged, encountered a cold sensation and felt something watching him. After he completed his prayer, they heard an even louder sound which indicated that this was where the spirits were connected. On that weekend, while Claire's husband was away playing baseball, the minister advised Care to move away from the apartment and to never return. When Robert Return, he found that the family had moved and were in a safe new place. Research showed that prior to it, a following, prior to and following 1981, other tenants had experienced strange happenings in the same house. One example was that of a woman who was in Yarmouth but still undergoing psychiatric care. The question arose: Did an unknown force cause her insanity? We will probably never know. Although the current owners deny any spiritual activity, it should be noticed that the previous owners, after selling the house, admitted that the, own, the house was haunted. The minister who assisted Kerr's family commented that the spirit can, can reside in the dwelling and these spirits can be very dangerous. He admitted that there were spirits in the Preston house and gave a warning that Ouija board are dangerous. He explained how different spirits can enter the person's body, mind, and soul. They can be in the form of a ghost, demon, poltergeist, or Jesus. An example would be, Jesus could be known to knock at your door, wanting to come into your heart, but none of these ghosts or demons could be knocking at your door. Also, though the Ouija board and the entire, the Ouija board and the entry to your home easily. These families could not have been destroyed if actions, this family could have been destroyed if actions hadn't been taken to banish the spirits which were conjured up by the use of the board. This magnetism which drew care to get involved and participate with the ghosts of Sam is over. The Prestons will never return to that house and never tempt fate again. Okay, that was not my best reading. 
1981, remember when. And 1981 was a sad year for many Canadians. It was the year that Terry Fox died, ending his marathon of hope, but raised $25 million for Canadian cancer research. In politics, in politics, Pierre Elliott Trudeau was still the Prime Minister of Canada. It was in 1981 that, the, that Ronald Reagan, President of the United States, visited with Trudeau, Trudeau in Ottawa. It was also turbulent times in the Canadian House of Commons as the opposition progressive conservatives under the Joe Clark understood undertook a filibuster in an effort to halt the constitutional package. The population of Canada was now at an almost 24, 24 and a half million people. An average Canadian had an annual income of $30,000. Jesus. A year and an average domestic car cost around $10,000 and a gallon of gas was around a dollar mark. Bread sold for $1.25 and a loaf, a loaf and milk cost $1.04 a liter. Property values had risen dramatically within an average three-bedroom Canadian home selling for around $76,000. $30,000. I've never had a $30,000 income, even in today. Anyway, technology continued to abound in 1981. Microvision pocket-sized television sets hit the market. The Space Shuttle Columbus, Columba, Columbia had made its first flight establishing metrics of re reusable spaceships. Also, space exploration, 1981, was the year the Voyager 2 sent pictures back to Earth of Saturn's surface. In the arts, top movie of the year was Char Chariots of Fire. Henry Ford and Catherine Hedburn were considered to be the top stars of the stage and screen. In music, the top songs were Nine to Five, I Love Davis Eyes, and Endless Love, and Physical. In sports, football, Grey Cup away from Ottawa with a final score of 26 to 23. The New York Islanders took the Stanley Cup away from Minnesota in horse ratings. <clears throat> in horse racing, Fiddle Dancer Boy won the Queen's Place. Plate. Words are hard. Now I get to more, more modern stuff. Pardon my sore neck. The Murder of Elizabeth Gale Tucker, Metagon Area, 1985. Think back to the time of the year Out of Africa was named Best Movie and the song Tears Are Not Enough made it big. That was the year of 1985. Try to imagine an 18-year-old girl, 5'3", 240, 200, <clears throat> 100, and 24 pounds with dark brown shoulder-length hair and green eyes. Elizabeth Gale Tucker was the average teenage girl. In April 1985, Tucker had plans to leave Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, where she lived with her mother, Mary Lake. Tucker wanted to follow up on a job opportunity with a fish plant in the Matagan area. She planned to visit and live with friends in Clare. On April 25th, Tucker loaded her belongings onto a truck rented by her friend. She showed the truck driver a, fold a folding knife and told him <coughs> that it was given to her by a former boyfriend. She also told him that she kept it with her at all times. Tucker's belongings were sent to her new home in Matagan, but she did not travel with the truck. Tucker stayed behind because she was offered a two-day babysitting job. Her employer promised her a free train ticket to her new home in Church Point. That promise was broken. With only $5 in her pocket, Tucker decided to hitchhike to her new address. So at 5 o'clock on, on April 30th, 1985, Tucker and a young friend walked down Primrose Avenue. Her friend went by the shopping mall while Tucker continued walking. A few minutes later, Tucker's friend, standing on the corner, saw Tucker get picked up by an early model gray two-door mid-sized car on Victoria Street in Dartmouth. The car is believed to have had rusty rust holes near the trunk key near 
rust holes near the trunk keyhole and near the passenger side of the door handle. The friend waved goodbye to each other. Tucker was last seen wearing a blue jeans, black leather high heeled boots, and carrying a gray handbag. Tucker's movements have been traced. A witness reported that Tucker was dropped off on the Wolfville exit. Another witness gave Tucker a drive from east of the Annapolis Royal Causeway between 8 and 8.30 p.m. Tucker was dropped off on the 101 east of Bear River Bridge. The next time Tucker was seen was between 9 and 10 p.m. She seemed confused as she was seen hitchhiking on both sides of the road in Digby. She was given a ride by two local residents. Tucker told the two people that she was given a ride into Digby by a trucker that was heading from Digby Ferry. Tucker was dropped off in Marshalltown. She, was, she asked the driver to drop her off at Weymouth train station. Around 10.30 p.m., April 31st, Tucker was seen standing on the Weymouth Bridge by passing motorists. It was later determined that Tucker was afraid of the dark. According to her mother, she was known to sleep with the lights on at night. So by this time, she may have been quite concerned, if not frightened, by the darkness on the, of the night. On October 6, 1985, a hunter in the wood area in Belleville Cove discovered Elizabeth Ga Gailey's Tucker's badly decomposed body only, 20 minutes, only 12 minutes from where she was last seen on April 30th of that same year. The chief medical examiner of the Nova Scotia confirmed that the body was indeed that of Tucker. The police suspected that the crime was committed by someone who knew the area quite well. When Tucker was discovered, her folding knife was nowhere to be found. No further evidence had been uncovered in the case and no further evidence had been uncovered in the case, and the last person to see Elizabeth Gail Tucker alive has never been found. Foul play is definitely suspected. All right. And that was Gail. I say Crime Stoppers, if you need it. 1985, remember when? One of the major events of 1985 was the discovery of the wreck of the Titanic off of Newfoundland. In politics, the progressive conservative government of Brian Mulroney was in office with a massive sweep of support from across Canada. Ronald Reagan was still the president of the United States. The best movie of 1985 was Out of Africa. The top Hollywood stars were William Hunt and Geraldine Page. On television, The Bill Cosby Show dominated the ratings. In music, the top songs were St. Elmo's Fire, Tears Are Not Enough, Take On Me, and Whisper. Bruce Springsteen released his famous Born in the USA, his famous Born in the USA album. And who could forget Live Aid and Farm Aid concert held around the world. In sports, the British Columbian Lions seized the Grey Cup away from Hamilton with a score of 37-24. In hockey, the Edmonton Oilers won the Stanley Cup over Philadelphia it was also the year that Peter Rose broke T Ty Kobe's four nine four record and set set back in 1928. That's some records. Okay. All right. Last one of this book. The murder. Can't even fucking read. I don't know who ever thought me. That, like, reading out loud would be an easy job to do. It's not. The Murder of Mary Ann Lamrock, Pumnico, 1990. On March 6, 1990, Mary Ann Lamrock, a 25-year-old woman from East Pumnico, went missing. Many describe her as shy and timid. She was a small woman, standing 5 foot 2 inches and weighed 140 pounds. She had a short, light brown hair and blue eyes, and had lived alone in East Pumnico since the suicide of her common-law husband, Elwyn Goodwin. Lamrock reportedly left East Pumnico at 1.30 p.m. on March 6 and began walking towards East Pumnico Head on Highway 3. The last confirmed sighting of her was at around 2 p.m. near the Meek Minco Disco Hall in Pumnico. She was wearing a red and gray jacket 
blue jeans, white sneakers, and carrying a brown tote bag. After not being able to reach her daughter for two days, Lamrock's mother, Mary Hubley, Herbley, called the police and reported her daughter missing. Lamrock was treated as a missing person. The fact that she left when she did raised some suspicions. If she had left of her own free will, some said she would have waited for her unemployment check, which would have arrived the following day. Lamarock was unemployed for the most part, except for during herring season when she worked at Lawrence Sweeney's Fisheries in Publico. Suspicion that Lamarock had met with foul play seemed to be confirmed two years later when Lamarock's body was found in a wooded area near Oak Park Road. On January 29, 1992, three rabbit hunters from Wedgeford literally stumbled over the skeletal remains. The body was found off Highway 103 on the Yarmouth and Shelburne County line. It was partially decomposed and some bones had been scattered. Many people reported they had previously been within yards of where the body was found, but because of the heavy thicket in the area, it went unnoticed. This heavy brush also forged, forced the police to cut the path to the area where Lamrock was found. Dental records and clothing and items were used to identify the remains. Autopsy and forensic tests were performed, but the RCMP released few details on the cause of death. The tests concluded that Lamrock had been murdered, and brutally so. Numerous stab wounds were found over the entire body, the wounds having been caused by a sharp, pointy instrument similar to a knife. A search involving searchers, a search involving searchers on their hands and knees combed the one-quarter square mile area around the site, and the use of dogs turned up a hunting-style knife. This knife may have connected to the murder, but no evidence has proven so. In November 1990, eight months after Lamrock disappeared, the RCMB had been called to investigate what seemed to be a shallow grave in the same area Lamrock's body was found. The hole was six feet long by two feet wide, big enough for a human body. But for some reason, the body of Mary Ann Lamrock was never placed in the grave. It could have been that the murderer was scared off in the process, also dropped the knife. Because the case is more than two years old, it's hard to find evidence to connect anyone with the murder. Anyone who was involved has had a lot of time to cover their tracks. With little evidence to follow up, the, uh, follow up on, the police are narrowing their search down to someone who was familiar with the area and the Highway 103 route from Shelburne to Pubnico, where Lamrock was last seen alive. There had been rumors linking Lamrock's family to the disappearance, but no evidence has been found to connect them to the crime. Lamrock was formerly from the Birch, Birchtown, Shelburne area and frequented hike area and frequently hitchhiked back and forth from Pubnico. Police are looking for someone whom she probably knew and got a ride with. Circumstances surrounding the death of Mary Ann Lamrock show a possible connection show a possible connection to the death of Gail Elizabeth Tucker. Tucker was found stabbed to death in Digby County, 1985. Her murder has also gone unsolved. The ultimate untimely death of Mary Ann Lamrock still remains unsolved to this day. Pumnico, public Cooperation is desperately needed to put together the pieces surrounding the disappearance and death of Mary Ann Lamrock. Anyone having information concerning any aspects of this case are asked to notify the Yarmouth District Police. That's the knife. That's the information. And I'm going to do a quick Google. Because I really want to know. Uh, did Gray kill... Okay. I think I need to look up McGray. Victims. I wonder if I can get a victim list from here. Wikipedia. Crimes.
Maybe it wasn't McGray. In 1991, McGray was still serving time in prison. Okay. Yep. This is her. On, Ma on May 1st, 1985, McGray murdered 17-year-old hitchhiker Elizabeth Tucker in a woods near Weymouth. So, McGray did kill her. I don't know. If she was another victim. It's 1985. think somebody else got her because according to this he was somewhere else but yeah they got her killer they got him they got killed her so but I don't think I don't think they found Mary's not yet anyway all right, that was Matter of Mystery. I'm going to ah, end the live stream here. Uh, the, the book we're going to do next is Matter of Mystery. Matter of, I'll just bring it over. There we go. Sorry, baby. So this is the first book. I cannot put this up any higher, can I? Nope. That's not up. Is that any better? All right. That's the second book. This is the first book. So I don't think we have many stories in this one. That's, that is one. Oh. That's two, three. Ooh, we got pictures. This one's actually a pretty hefty book. Yes. All right, I'm gonna quit this live stream and we'll do one story out of the new one. All right. Ow.